As Edward said, I, um, I'm going to bring the end of our Presence and Power series, which has just been so wonderful. Um, in some ways, this is a bit of an epilogue um, to the series and a bit of a prologue to the series that comes up uh, next week, um, which I will uh, talk about in a moment. But before I do, I wanted to give you all just a, an update before I preach. Um, as you know, for the past year or so, we have been working with His Majesty's prison, the Mount, um, on running a Verso site within the prison. As you know, uh, we are a multi-site church. That means we're one church, but multiple locations. Um, we are meeting here at St. Albans, but our Hatfield site are meeting as well. And um, we will be later this year launching uh, new sites. As you know, we announced Verso Hemel, go to the quiz night. Uh, Verso Luton as well. That is the direction the Lord has us on as we extend our reach to reach the lost. And so uh, a couple of years ago, we, reached, we launched um, Verso the Mount. But what I want to communicate to you is that following the changes to our compassion and justice ministry and the evolution to include a, a more a specific focus on mission, um, which as a church, we will communicate in the autumn term some extremely exciting plans in terms of what God has for us in this next chapter as it relates to mission and really looking forward to communicating that with you. Um, but I'm pleased to communicate today that the Mount site will actually be transitioning into a new model within Verso. So it will no longer be a Verso site, but we will work with the Mount Chaplaincy on specific missional projects within that community. And so that change is now happening we continue, I want to say, to see the Mount as an important reach activity. The testimonies we've heard of the, the stories of the men in the prison of which 60 have been meeting, roughly 60 or so every Sunday, have been amazing. Encounters of Jesus, lives being transformed, and salvations, people coming to know Jesus. And so I'm excited uh, at the opportunity that the Mount continues to present to us as we evolve the way in which uh, we work with the Mount. If you would like any more information about that, then you can email the office or indeed you can grab me and speak to me. But I wanted to let you know of a change there with that ministry. Well, let me move on. I, um, what I'm thinking is I might do something a little bit different uh, before the start of my, before my talk. Um, why don't we all stand? And if you're at home, welcome. Why don't you stand as well? Or you'll catch up during the week. And um, I feel like, I, I just feel like the Lord has a word for us, maybe two or three words from, from you guys. I'm going to pray. And then if you feel led that the Lord has given you a word for us as a church, then I'm going to ask you to be brave and to speak that out. And Edward's got a microphone over here. And so as you start speaking, he'll kind of start rushing over to you. Uh, so maybe start speaking and then pause and put your hand up so Edward can see. Um, only looking for three words. And I, I just, yeah, let's, let me pray and then uh, let's go from there. Lord, thank you that you are a God who speaks. You are a living God. We don't come here to worship a a God that's dead, but a God that is alive, as we've been singing. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would speak to us as a church. Holy Spirit, come. Open our ears to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Sister, please. We need revival. Amen. Lord, we thank you for that word. Yeah. We do need revival, Lord. We need you to revive our hearts. Lord, would you just speak to us and, and, and this morning and show us what revival means for each one of us. We often um, pray for revival and we look to, our, to others to be revived. And yet, Lord God, that is a message straight to our hearts. I pray this morning, Lord, that you would open that word up and that you would reveal to us what you mean and what you're saying to us as individuals and as your church. Thank you, Jesus. 
as we were singing Holy Spirit Come, um, I had a vision and I saw the Holy Spirit pouring out his anointing and God reminded me that he's El Rohi, God who sees. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, you are God who sees. Lord, you see us where we are at. You see the condition that we're in. We, you see the good bits and the bad bits and everything in between. Lord, help us to understand this morning what you mean by that word. Thank you, Jesus. I've got these three words. Um, love is enduring. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jay. Lord, we thank you that your love indeed is enduring. But Lord, if we're, if we're honest, we don't always understand your love. If we're honest, we, we cannot admit to always walk in in your love. I pray this morning, Lord God, that you would open our eyes and our hearts to to that amazing love that you have for each one of us. And Lord, I thank you for these three words, revival, God who sees us, and love that is enduring. And I pray, Lord God, that as I preach your word this morning, that you would animate these three words, Lord God, that you would speak to us, open our eyes to something new, I pray, in your precious name, amen. You may be seated, church. <clears throat> okay. Um, recently, Steph and I have, well, I decided, I'm going to take the credit for this one because she normally comes up with the good ideas. I would, I would relive my youth by, by playing or watching with my kids all those old 80s movies. So much fun. Um, last night, we watched Big with Tom Hanks. You know that movie? Some of you maybe are too young. Um, great movie. And then last week we watched War Games. Remember that old movie where um, the guy, the, the computer geek, hacks into uh, the Pentagon or whatever mainframe and starts a, a nuclear war simulation? Anyone remember that? Great movie. Um, so uh, I love, I, I mean, I generally love these kind of movies. And do you know those movies where you've got someone and they're dying? Oh, Mark, Mark, that's morbid. No, go with me. And, and they're on their deathbed and they say to the person, listen, if there's just one thing you've got to remember. And they're like, yes, what is it? If there's only one thing that you remember from this, yes, what is it? Listen, this is critical. Okay, tell me what it is. Listen, I'm going to tell you this now. Please don't forget. Yes, what is it? It's all. <laughs> you've seen those movies, right? It's like, for goodness sake, just say the thing. Like, if I was in that situation, I'd be like, here it is. It's like another bit in movies, you know, <laughs> you know, when the baddie's about to kill the person. And they decide rather than kill them there and then they'll go into some amazing monologue. <laughs> Let me tell you. And I'm going to reveal to you my plans. <laughs> and then what happens? They never, it's just honestly, if, if I was an evil, evil bad guy, I'd be just, no, let's, let's not go there. This is. <laughs> This is the danger of not following the notes, okay? Not an evil bad guy, just want to clarify. But I do love movies. And, <coughs> excuse me, and as I remembered those, those, those movies and those moments where someone would say, you know, listen, it's the last thing you listen. I found myself this morning, because I didn't exactly know what to preach, and it was only later, the latter part of this week, um, I found myself asking myself the question, if I was to preach my last sermon on Sunday, what would I preach? Now, I always preach as if it could be my last sermon because I pray that Jesus will come back every day. Maranatha. You know, did you know there's a crown of righteousness for those that are seeking his appearing, as it says in the scriptures? Like, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus. And so I do preach every Sunday as if this could be my last preach and this could be the last time we, we are together. But as I said, I found myself, um, and it wasn't a product of being, you know, melancholy or morbid. It was just, you know, interesting. Like, what would, would it be? And instantly the Lord gave me a, a verse or a piece of the Bible, some scripture, which I want to offer as, 
And this is not a prophetic declaration that this is my last preach, just to clarify. This is not some kind of way of handing my resignation in. No, it's just, <laughs> it's just saying before summer comes and we all head off for our holidays, um, what kind of thing would you want to hear uh, from, from the pastor as you head off on your holidays and the kind of the, the important thing? And so we're going to look at that this morning. And uh, I'm going to weave in these three words from the Lord as he enables enables me. And I'd like us to turn to Matthew 22, wherein the scripture that we are going to look at together. And it's going to be from verses 36 to 40. And uh, we find we're in a situation where oftentimes the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Sadducees and Pharisees were teachers of the law, but they were slightly different. The Sadducees didn't believe in, in kind of life after death in terms of being eternally with God. The Pharisees did. And, and these guys would take it in turns to try and, and kind of outfox God. They would try and take, or Jesus, they would try and catch him out. And so what we find in, as we're going to read this is that uh, the Sadducees had asked Jesus a question about marriage and what that means if, you know, if someone dies and you marry again. Well, what does that look like in heaven then, Jesus? Hey, solve that one. And then Jesus came with something and completely silenced them and they kind of moved away. And so the Pharisees thought, well, we'll have a go. And that's where we join it in, um, in verse 36, which I want to look at. It says this. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer... You can imagine, can't you? Right, who's got a really good question for Jesus? Come on, you're a lawyer. Come on, let's get him out. Like, we're not like those Sadducees. That's stupid. We are Pharisees. We know exactly what we're doing. So, so they go and ask Jesus this question to try and catch him out. And he asks him this, teacher, rabbi, which is the great commandment in the law? What is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. If you had that moment where Jesus said, listen, I want to leave you with something really important. If you're going to remember one thing, remember this. This is that one thing that we should remember. If this was my last preach, um, and as I said, this is not me resigning in front of you all, then this is what I would preach. Like if I were to sum up everything, if we were to try and sum up presence and power as way of an epilogue, if I was to introduce the summer series which starts next Sunday with a prologue, I would say, listen, if there's one thing, remember this greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so I'm going to spend the time that we have together unpacking this for us uh, if you will join me on that. Let us look at this, and this is, I'm sure you've heard this many a time. You know, Jesus was actually quoting Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5, that to, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with your soul, it was a reminder to them. And Leviticus 19, 18, about loving your neighbor. And so Jesus put this together and said, listen, if this is one thing, this is the thing, because everything hinges on this. It's not like if you've only got the energy to do one thing, just ignore all the rest and do this. It's not that. It's, listen, if you want to do all this, then it's about love. Loving God the Father and one another. If you can do that, everything else will flow. And that's what I want to look at together. Let's, let's unpack it. Let's look at um, verse uh, 37. He said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your mind, with all your soul. Let's look at those together. With all your heart. What does that mean, with all your heart? As I was contemplating on this yesterday, I was reminded of uh, when Jesus in Matthew 6, 21, so prior to this story, was talking about the inability for us to serve both money and God. You'll either love the one or hate the other. You, you know, you can't be serving mammon, money, the world, and serve God at the same time. And Jesus made this statement. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's an interesting comment. It's not where your heart is, there's your treasure's going to be. What he's saying is, is, listen, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And think about that. I think that's true. I remember one time I had some money in, in, in US dollars, in an account, in a US dollar account. 
And my treasure was there, and so my heart was in the exchange rate every day. Like, I was watching for the right moment to transfer USD to GBP. My treasure was there, my heart was there. If any of you have got stocks and shares or maybe investments, you know that you know, your heart's in. I don't have any more USD. And so my heart is no longer in the exchange rate mechanism. But it is a truism that where your treasure is, that which you value highly, that which you esteem much, that which you would say is more valuable than anything else, that where your treasure is, your heart will follow. Now, why is your heart important? Because our heart is, is, the, is the rudder of our lives. Our heart is the thing that directs us. It is the seat of us. It is the, where our affections are. Our heart is the true north, if you like, of our life. You know, that thing that you base your direction on, the thing that you decide on your priorities on, your priorities, your bank balance, your diary, those things reflect where your treasure is, don't they? You look at your bank statement, that reflects where your treasure is, what you spend your money on, your, your calendar, your diary reflects where your treasure is, those things that you spend your time on. Your commitment, where you serve, demonstrates where your treasure is as it relates to those things that you spend your energy on. And it is true because our heart is the thing, it's like the true north of our lives. And I think that as Christians, and if you call yourself, if you confess and profess a faith in Christ Jesus here this morning, that you would say, well, my treasure is Jesus. Like you've made that decision. But I suspect that like me, as we mature in Christ and as we, you know, as a follower of Jesus, we, we, there are these moments where we get stirred to press in and yet we feel a resistance in pressing in. It's almost as if there is an apathy maybe or a fear. Or maybe what it boils down to is, haven't I sacrificed enough for you, Jesus, and yet you're asking me to do this? And it's in that moment that Jesus says, well, where is your treasure? It's in that moment that God uses that moment to reveal other treasures in our hearts that are not in him. And that's a work of Jesus being the author and perfecter, finisher of our faith, as it says in the scriptures. You know, being a Christian isn't a one-time event that you get a ticket to heaven. Being a Christian means that we are following hard after Jesus, that we recognize that we're being conformed into the likeness of Jesus, that we are saying, I want to be like Jesus. And so if we recognize that that's what it means to be a Christian, then we have to expect that there are going to be these moments where the Holy Spirit reveals something in our heart which needs to change. And so we can say on the out, I love Jesus with my heart. The question is, I don't doubt that there are parts of your heart, but the question is more this, is your whole heart devoted to Jesus? Is he your 100% treasure? That's the challenge. You know, it's the story of the rich man, the rich young man found in Matthew 19, 16, 30. This rich young man is uh, rather pleased with himself because he has followed the law to a T. He has done everything Jesus said. He's a good guy. I'm sure this young rich ruler, the young man has benefited his community. He's done everything. He hasn't, quote, sinned. He's followed the regulations, and uh, Jesus says, that's great, but what I want you to do is sell everything and come follow me. And the rich young man says, well, that's just, I can't do that. Why? Because his treasure wasn't 100% Jesus or God. His money was his treasure. Now, this is not a, uh, a call in for everyone to go sell their stuff. Jesus in that moment was revealing the reality and the truth that where that man's treasure was, there his heart was also. And for some of us this morning in this place, in this space, God by his spirit is revealing to you where you may have your treasures. Let's move on, shall we? Because Jesus said, treasure, mind, soul, let's look at mind. So that's the heart. 
What about the mind? What does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your mind? Well, it really means to think about with reverence and adoration our God. It means to hold him in high esteem as we reflect on him, as we meditate on his goodness. It means that we have ultimately a healthy fear of God. A healthy fear of the Lord. What do I mean by, you know, it's not very popular to preach on the fear of the Lord because of fear that the people will think that, well, I don't, but God doesn't want us to be in fear. Well, you're right that God doesn't want you to be in terror of him. God is not wanting you to be so fearful of him in terror that you run away from him. A healthy, holy fear of the God, a fear of the Lord is with such reverence and adoration that we would run towards him, that we would not wish to sin against him, that we would bow our knee in humble adoration and say, Lord God, you are holy and I revere you in holy fear. I want to cling on to you with all that I am. That is what it means to have a holy fear. And I preached on this last year. It's the holy fear of the Lord and his love that we need to walk straight the straight path. I gave a story of a famous evangelist who um, was locked up for some misdemeanors and... Um, John Bevere went to visit him, and you can read about this story in John Bevere's book, Fear of the Lord, which I'd recommend. And, uh, and, 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 and the, the, the tele-evangelist was repentant, and as John sat with him in prison, he said to this guy, what, what, what was it? What, what was the reason? Why did you fall, you know? And to cut a long story short, the tele-evangelist said this, it's because I stopped fearing the Lord. I knew he loved me. I would proclaim he loved me and then I would go sin. But he said what I had lost was the fear of the Lord. I had lost the holy reverential fear of God. Listen, we need a healthy dose of his love and his fear. Like we have lost it. Like if we truly understood in our mind his holiness, if we truly understood in our mind the, the reality that he flung the stars into space, that everything is held by, in his hands, that he sustains the life by his breath, the Ruach of God, if we truly comprehended it in our mind, do you think we would treat God in the way oftentimes we do? As some kind of cosmic Father Christmas that we kind of go to when we need something and yet treat him so poorly when we don't. And I, I'm sorry if this is a hard word. I mean, it feels a bit hard, hey? But the truth is, if we want to sign up to this and say, I want to love the Lord God, then, then we need to recognize that we need to hold him in a holy, reverential fear, a holiness. God is a holy God. You know, it says in Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. In the scripture, it also talks about that the, that the holy fear of God is a fountain of life. If you want to walk in the blessings of God, if you want to align yourself with God and walk in all that he has for you, then brother and sister in Christ, can I suggest to you that the root of that, of living that life, is to have a holy fear of God. And for some of you, you know, I want to just mention that Many parts of the church global have taken God's grace and turned it into hyper grace, which essentially is license to do what you want. God's grace isn't there to cover up your bad living. God's grace is there to empower right living. That's what God's grace is. And so even the Apostle Paul said, listen, does God's grace mean that we can do what we want? For, no, no, no way, he said. I'm paraphrasing with modern vernacular. Like, just because God is gracious, and he, gracious means he holds back that which, he gives us that which we don't deserve, that's grace. He gives us that which we don't deserve. 
Just because God is gracious does not give you a license to go do what you wanna do. And so when we decide and make a choice in our mind to love the Lord our God with all of our mind, we need to hold him in reverence. And something else that's linked with this is that Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep, keep my commandments. I mean, Jesus said it. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Like, love has an action. Love is not just a, a warm, fuzzy feeling that you experience. Love demonstrates itself. It, you know, and, and you can look at this and say, well, Mark, this is hard. I try. And, I, and I, I'm not suggesting that we should live a life of perfection. I'm not suggesting that we'll always get it right. What I'm talking about is a decision that we make to say, Lord, in spite of the fact that I find it difficult, I'm gonna make a choice to follow you and obey your commands. And Lord Jesus, in that, would you help me, Spirit of God, help me to obey God? Like my prayer is, Lord, I love you so much. And yet in my human frailty, I can't always obey you. I repent and I ask for forgiveness. So would you help me, God? Help me, Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, you said that you're gonna to go to ascend to the Father and you said to the apostles that good news, the Father is going to send to you the Holy Spirit which will help you and guide you and be your comforter. I'm like, Lord, I need that Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I need you right now. I need you to equip me and to fill me, enabling me to walk in the love of Christ. And so I don't want you leaving this place feeling condemned and battered because you're not obeying God's commands. What I want you to do is leave this place feeling encouraged and excited about the reality that Jesus has sent, that God the Father has sent the Holy Spirit to empower you to obey Jesus. That's a good thing. Like I would say for sure, like I am a very different Christian now than I was 10, 15, 20 years ago. And that, I hope that would be the case for all of you too. Like, there are, I obey God now in things that I never used to obey God in because I'm seeing the fruit of, bearing, of, of abiding in the vine, of allowing the Spirit of God to change me so that what happens is, is I want to obey God. My inclinations are such that I love Jesus because my treasure is Him. And so because my heart is inclined to Him, my mind finds it easier to say, I'm going to obey Jesus and I'm going to hold Him in reverent fear, yeah? Plus, I think that many of you would attest to this who are mature Christians, that what you recognize and realize is that there is joy and fruitfulness in, in the things that God prescribes for us. I mean, God doesn't give us a bunch of rules to make our lives dreary. God doesn't give us a bunch of regulations to constrain us. God gives us rules to live by in order that we can live our best life. And I don't mean that in a name it, claim it kind of way. I mean it in walking in all the spiritual blessings that he has for us. You know, if you buy a, a product, let's say you, you have a car and the manual says, put petrol in it. And you say, well, I don't want to put petrol in it. Why should I? I like diesel. I don't care what God says. He's, what a horrible God. How dare he make me get petrol? And so you go put diesel in your car. And you soon find out that the car won't work properly. Well, we have a manual, it's called the Bible. And it gives us a way to live a blessed life. And yet we wonder why we have so many issues when we go, well, I don't, I don't agree with that, Lord. I'm gonna do it my way. So, like, okay, go for it. Well, I'm mindful of the time and um, we better continue. That's heart and mind. Let's look at soul. What does soul mean? It speaks to our whole our whole being, it's like um, our soul is, is eternal. And I'm reminded of Psalm 42.1. This is just such a famous psalm. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you. Like there is this recognition that at our very core, our very existence, who we are is our desire for him. I read it in a book recently. They said, when you strip out all of the things, our skills, our character, like all the things we do, our profession, when it comes down to it, what defines who we are is our desire for him. I love that. 
when it comes down to it, what defines who we are as humans is our desire for him. As the deer pants for the water brooks, like, are you panting? Is your soul panting for God? Or are you so filled up with the world that you feel like you're satisfied? And Fred preached on this a few weeks ago, didn't he? And as I was thinking through this, I was reminded of the Apostle Paul. And he, and he wrote to the church in Rome, and you can read this in chapter 12. And he said, essentially, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters he said, in light of what Jesus has done for you, in light of the fact that he died on the cross for you, in light of the fact that he loved you before you even knew who he was, in fact, in light of the fact that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, in light of that fact, brothers and sisters, I beseech you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That is your act of spiritual worship. You see, worship aren't, isn't songs. That, I don't know how in the Christian world we've reduced worship to singing. Worship songs, songs is an expression of a life that's in worship to him. The songs are a way in which we express lives that have been tied down to the altar and said, Lord, I'm yours, you take me. I'll give you everything. I've met so many Christians that... I remember once someone said to me, I've mentioned this before, an older Christian, he said to me, Mark, I want to tell you something. He said, the problem with Christians, they don't speak lies, they sing them. Oh, what do you mean by that? He says, well, think about it. How many times do you sing the songs and you say something out of your mouth about Jesus and yet does your life reflect it? It's like, wow. Like, I would suggest to you what would it look like if we only sang songs that we really met, meant? Next time we sing songs, look at the words and think, Lord, like, how do you think God the Father feels when we sing words to him, like, I'll do anything for you, I'll run to you, like, I lay my life for you, like, whatever the words are, and then we leave this place and it's like, well, I don't see that. You cry out to me on a Sunday and sing out to me how beautiful and wonderful I am and all these things, and I don't see it in your life. How do you think that grieves the heart of God? Like we are to love the Lord with our whole soul, and it means that we say, well, Jesus, you picked up your cross, I'm going to pick up mine. I'm going to die to the fleshly things that I want to do. I'm going to die to my own agenda. I'm going to die to my own needs and wants. And I'm going to say, you know what? I've been purchased by your blood. I'm yours. I'm going to get on that altar and I'm going to say, take me, Jesus. Do whatever you want me to do. You know, we were at the send, what, two, three weeks ago on a Sunday. About 80 people from Verso were there. And we saw 592 young adults put their hands up and say, I'm going to give my life to going to the nations and following our heart after Christ. What a moment. What a moment. <laughs> what were they doing? They were saying, Lord, I'm going to love you with all my soul. I'm going to strap myself to the altar and say, I'm yours. You do with me as you wish. Now, that might come across as a bit scary. I get it. Like, really? Wow, that's pretty hardcore. I don't think I'm there yet. It's okay for you, Mark. You're a pastor. I'm just human too. I'm on this journey with you. I'm not suggesting it's easy. I'm not suggesting there are moments I'm like, oh, my word, seriously, Lord? But if we're committed to following Jesus and to loving him, then we say, Holy Spirit, would you help me get on that altar and be a living sacrifice for you? Are you with me, church? So we've just spent some time looking at loving the Lord your God. And I hope that uh, you have taken some gold from that in terms of what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. But I, what I want to look at now is the second part of this, which is to love your neighbor as yourself in verse 39. Now, <clears throat> there's a vertical thing that happens. We love God first. Have you noticed the order of this? And then we love each other as yourself. Now, let's look at this because 
I want to say this. You can't love others if we don't first love ourselves. I think if the truth was told, and I've heard some psychologists reference this, that one of the reasons why we see what we do in the world around us is that people just don't love themselves. And what comes out of how they feel about themselves, they project onto other people. I mean, if I asked you in those quiet moments, how do you feel about yourself? Could you, and don't put your hands up, don't answer, could you honestly say that you love yourself? I mean, I know how I feel sometimes. I mean, I have to catch myself sometimes. There's a lot of occasion where I'll come out with, oh, Mark, you're so stupid. And I'm like, no, I just repent of those words. I'm not stupid. And like, we have to be careful what comes out of our mouth. I mean, the power in our words. Sally did a phenomenal job preaching on that uh, a few weeks ago. And if you missed that, do catch up. You know, we, we, when we start using words outside of God's truth, we, we fall into the trap of witchcraft and we start speaking curses and hexes and incantations over ourselves and others. Did you know that? Power in the word. Life and death is in the tongue. And we often speak curses over ourselves. And so how do you, maybe, maybe you feel like, well, I'm the least of the least. Or maybe it's like, well, people don't think highly of me. And, and, and deep down, actually, if, if the truth were told and if we had a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you felt safe enough to speak to me about it, you'd say, I don't really like myself very much, to be honest. But you see, in this is the challenge to say, listen, we need to love ourselves. Now, what does that love look like? Well, it's not an Instagram kind of love. You know where I'm going with this. It's not like, check me out. I'm in love with myself. <laughs> you know, love yourself has been an excuse not to take correction. Just love yourself. Be who you are. You know, loving yourself is not to accept there isn't a better way. Loving yourself doesn't mean that we don't realize that there is a higher standard. You know, at the vineyard, what we say is come as you are, but don't stay as you are. And that's really about loving yourself because you recognize that God's got more for you. You know, there's always been this conversation, well, should we say the second bit? You know, we should say come as you are, but don't stay as you are. Isn't that a little bit off-putting? Well, I don't know. That's kind of the gospel isn't it? I mean, being conformed to the lineness of the sun, well, it, there's change that requires it. <laughs> you know, Apostle Paul said we're from one degree of glory to the next. I mean, come as you are, but got some good news for you. Don't have, you don't have to stay as you are. And I don't think people want to stay as they are, quite frankly. I know I don't. But loving yourself isn't about saying, you know what? My truth is my truth. Look at my wonderful life. You know, when the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, he said this, and it's in chapter three, verses two to five. In the last days, people will be lovers of self. And the selfie will be introduced and invented. They'll be lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, Treacherous, reckless, swollen, conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having the appearance of godliness but denying its power thereof. I was following it all up. I was like, yeah, that's other people, that's other people. And then having the appearance of godliness. I'm like, oh, maybe he's speaking to some of us. I mean, we are in the last days. I mean, listen, we're not just in the last days, we're in the last minutes and seconds. I mean, <laughs> you read in the, in the Bible here, the Apostle John said we're in the last days when he wrote this 2000, 2,000 years ago. So if we're in the last days then, we're probably in the last seconds now, no? And don't we see this around us? The Instagram generation. Listen, I've got nothing against Instagram, by the way. It's an amazing tool. I don't have, like, technology is neutral. But it has the danger of feeding into this self-love and this... But do these people really love each themselves? Because when they put their phone down and they're not in their Insta world or TikTok world, their lives don't really reflect that which they're projecting. Deep down, they don't love themselves. 
So what does it mean to love ourselves? It's a love that's rooted in Christ Jesus. A love which is anchored on the love that God has for you. That's what it means to love yourself. It is a love which is anchored on the love that God has for you. I would say you cannot love yourself in the way God is calling us to until we've experienced his love for us. How does love God love us? We are the apple of his eye. Psalm 1718. We are his beloved. Isaiah 43, 1. He came to save us that we may have life and have it abundantly. John 10, 10. It says in Zephaniah that he sings over us. Excuse me? The God of the universe, is he not busy enough as it is? That he wants to sing and dote over me? Yeah, that's God. God loves us. Now, we can look at our lives and go, well, Mark, listen, I just want to tell you something. My life does not reflect a God that loves me. I've had people say to me, Mark, if God really loved me, then why would I go through this? And I have to say, brothers and sisters, these are some of the most difficult pastoral conversations I have because as part of I can say, I don't really know. But what I do know is God will work all things for good for those that love him and accord according to your purpose. That I stand on the truth that God is a loving parent. Listen, there are times where my kids will shout at me and say, well, if, if only you loved me, you'd let me. What a phrase. <laughs> if only you'd love me, you'd let me. It's because I love you that I'm not letting you. Well, that's not fair. And my kids are beautiful and they're like every other kid. I'm not picking out on them. But. And we know. Like, God loves us as a parent. And so there are things that we go through that maybe because of consequences of decisions we've made and, and the Heavenly Father says, listen, you're going to have to get through this, but I am here with you in it. Like we, there are consequences to our decisions. There are things that happen because of what we've done and said, and we have to walk through those consequences. But in that moment, God is with us. And he said, listen, I'm going to bring something good out of this. I'm going to bring, because I love you. Just notice the time. Claire, join me on the, on the stage. I thought this would be a 15-minute talk. Maybe I should do it two, two weeks. But, and so what I want to transition to in the, in the next few minutes is this. <coughs> and I realize there's so much here in this talk, and I've offered you a smorgasbord of, of truth that the Holy Spirit is going to highlight for you. For some, it's going to be some aspect. For some, it's going to be something else. But it's out of that place of loving ourselves in the way that we understand God loves us that then we can love our neighbor. And who is my, is my neighbor, you may ask me. Well, that's a question that's, that people have asked Jesus 2,000 years ago. And Jesus responded, did he not, with the parable of the Good Samaritan. He said, listen, your neighbor is anyone around you. Your neighbor is anyone regardless of their ethnic background, their religious background, their socioeconomic status, their geographical location. Like your neighbor is humankind, mankind. That's, that's your neighbor. Your neighbor isn't just the one that you get along with and the one that is nice to you. The neighbor is the one that Maybe you don't even identify with. You don't even understand them. Well, that's so far from who I am. Regardless, we are to love. You see, love is at the center. When you strip everything else away, everything, everything hinges on loving God and loving each other as we love ourselves. If we fully comprehended the truth of his love, then our lives would be different, our neighborhoods would be different, our communities would be changed, our country would look different than it is and the world would be transformed. And so if this were to be my last ever preach, if this were to be that movie moment 
where the person dying would say, listen, if there's one thing you need to remember, it is this, love conquers all things. That we are to love Him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all of our mind. And we are to love our neighbour as we love ourselves. Listen, as we go into our summer holidays and some of you will be meeting up with friends and family, I wanna say this, care less and love more. Just care less about what happens, you know, but just love more. It doesn't matter. Yes, you wanna do this, they, they wanna do, like, it doesn't matter. The question is, are we loving more? Care less and love more. And church, with that, can I ask you to stand as I pray?